Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday, 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Covenant. It's great to gather with you all. If you're a guest this morning, uh, we're so glad that you've uh, joined us. In our call to worship today in Psalm 150, it's this, this call to praise God, but I, I like the way that the psalm encourages us. Wh- like, why do we praise God? It says, praise him for his acts of power. So we praise God by looking backwards and think about what God has done in salvation history, but also what he's done in our lives. And then we we think about what he is doing in our lives. And then we also think about the acts of power that he promises to do. So we think about his actions and we praise him because of that, but also it says praise him for his surpassing greatness. It's not only what he does, but it's, it's who he is. He is surpassingly great. And so towards that, I invite you to stand now, if you will, as we read this call to worship from Psalm 150 that says, praise God for his acts of power and praise him because he is surpassingly great. Uh, Please join aloud in the all section. Peace be with you. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you this morning. God, we thank you that you are the creator and the sustainer of all things. That you are our redeemer. That you have acted in power to be victorious over sin and evil and death in this world and for us. So we praise you for your acts of power, but more than that, God, you are surpassingly great. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. You are good, and you're good to us. And so I pray that you would help us to praise you, to fix our attention on you in heart and mind and body and soul to be present and to praise you. And we pray all this. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Let's sing and worship to God our King. Oh, worship the King all glorious. Worship the King all glorious above and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light and canopy space. The chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is His path on the wings of the storm. Sing, you alone. Above thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, a maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. You alone, you alone are the matchless king. To you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? Wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with this morning and reflect on these words that are on the screen from Ephesians 2. That God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Let's continue to worship. We've been made alive by Jesus. I once was dead in sin.
Great news, my sin has been erased. My sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. My sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. You have brought me back with the riches of your amazing. Lord, we thank you for the, the rich promises that we have just sung, that in Christ we are alive, that by grace through faith our sins are erased, and that is, that is something to, to sing and to dance and to be grateful for. And as we come into this time of confession, we thank you that we come as people in Christ who are alive, not dead, who are filled with grace, not contempt by you. So thank you for your posture towards us as we come to you. In Christ's name, amen, amen. You know, the great church uh, reformer and theologian John Calvin, he talked about two types of knowledges that we need. He said we need the knowledge of God. We need to think about God and that's what we've done. We've, we've talked about how God is praiseworthy already. We've, we've sung that he is the matchless king. We've talked about his grace towards us and erasing sin. So we think of God, the one who's surpassingly great. But then Calvin also talks about we then think of ourselves, the knowledge of self, and we realize the gap there. And that's what confession is. It's both acknowledging that gap and it's, it's confessing that gap and it's asking God, to reorder our desires, to reform us where we are deformed, where we are not loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, when we're not loving our neighbors. And when we do this, we're, we're mindful that, that we are coming to the one who is good and good to us and for us. And so I invite you to read the prayer of confession on your own and your handout on the screen and pray over it, and then we'll, we'll pray that aloud, and then there'll be about 30 seconds for you just to be with the Lord on your own. Let's pray this aloud together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that leads to death. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, Amen. Take about 30 seconds just to be with the Lord on your own.
Hear these words of encouragement and forgiveness from John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So, Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son to us, not to condemn us, not to wave his fist at us, but to forgive us, to be our substitute and our sacrifice, to live the life we should have lived, to die the death we should have died, and to rise from the grave and be victorious over sin and evil and death. God, by grace through faith, you don't condemn us for the ways in which our desires and, and longings are disordered, but you come and you forgive us and you love us by grace through faith. May that erase doubt and fear in our lives and replace it with hope and confidence. We thank you for this. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand now, if you would, as we recite this great creed of the church, the Nicene Creed that really tells the story. It tells the story of how Christ saved the world. So would you declare this with me? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
God, we lift up our voices to you. Uh, for if we're honest uh, with ourselves, uh, we are broken people. We are people who uh, lose our ways. Uh, we go directions that we think are good and healthy on our own uh, and many times realize that they are destructive. And that's uh, why we need you. It's why we need a Savior. It's why we need Jesus. Uh, Jesus to come in and not only make our lives right with you, but to make our lives right as we live them out. And so uh, would we lean in on you, lean in on your spirit uh, as we cry out that all we have is Christ for Jesus. You are our hope now and forevermore. Uh, and we pray this in your powerful name. Amen. Uh, this is now a time for us to greet one another for the next five minutes. And kids, you have classes this morning, so you can go out into the lobby and meet your teachers out there. Thanks. It's good to be with you all for worship today. Uh, I just want to turn your attention to the back of the, uh, the worship handout. Just a few announcements to draw your uh, attention to. The first at the top, if you're, you're new or you're newish, we'd love for you to know what's happening in the life of the church. And the best way with the most information is our, our weekly newsletter that goes out. And there's different ways to sign up for that. And also, if you'd like to participate in the, the mission of the church through giving, there's also a number of ways you can do that. And as you know, after church each Sunday, we, we gather in the gym, which is just right behind here. We've got snacks and food and space for kids to play. Uh, please take advantage of that. Linger for a little while and have a conversation with someone. Make a new friend, whether it's there or feel free to stay in this uh, space as well. Um, two particular announcements coming up. The first is this Tuesday at 1 p.m. in this space, we're having a, a memorial service for Brian Johnson. So Brian was a longtime member here and uh, just going to have a time to, to gather and remember his life and to, to hope in the resurrection. And so if you have uh, space and time, I encourage you to come and be an encouragement to his family and to, uh, to gather together this Tuesday at, at 1 p.m. Also, uh, this Thursday, we're starting our first uh, cultural conversation, and our hope is to do this a, a few times a year. And the idea behind these are that there's just a, a number of topics as we, we live in our uh, cultural moment and follow Jesus that uh, are, are difficult and challenging that we probably want to give extra time to think about, to talk about, to di have discussions ab about. And uh, one of those is certainly politics. And so this Thursday we're gathering at 530. Uh, we're going to meet up in Taylor Hall, which is the second floor of the education building towards the back. 530 to 730, food is provided, child care is provided. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to come. And really the posture of these conversations is one of curiosity. It is charity and mutual encouragement. So we're not, we're not coming to kind of be polemical. We're coming together to, to learn and to courage and iron sharpens iron. And how do we follow Jesus together? Because Jesus, as we've already sung today, is the king of this world and the king of our lives. And so there's no part of our lives that we can segment off and, and say, well, that is mine. That's not Jesus's. And politics is part of that. And so how do we, no matter how we vote, how do we follow Jesus uh, in, in the way that we think about politics, the way that we uh, treat others, how do we talk about that? So encourage you to come to that. There'll be uh, teaching involved. There'll be group discussion, table discussion. It'll be, um, I'm praying, a meaningful time. And so I encourage you to, to do that. Please RSVP. Um, I know many of you are coming. We've got uh, over 40 registered, so grateful for that. And, uh, but please RSVP so we can know how much uh, food to get. So encourage you towards that end. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite us now to our time of prayers of the people. And this is that time where we, we pray for uh, our household of faith. We pray for our city. We pray for our world. And I'll uh, pray, and then I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and encourage you as a congregation to say, Lord, hear our prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we thank you for um, the church. Lord, we thank you for this church. Um, the idea of church is a, a miracle. Uh, different generations, different ages, different backgrounds, different cultures and ethnicities brought together, not merely to an event, but brought together as 
brothers and sisters in Christ brought together as a household of faith. Um, however imperfectly, Lord, you are building us more and more into your perfect image. So, Lord, I pray that you would increase our bonds of, of unity and togetherness and mutual encouragement. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the life of uh, Brian Johnson. Uh, Lord, thank you for his participation in this community. Lord, thank you for your life and death and resurrection and his faith in that. And Lord, we claim the promises that he is alive and well with you now. Lord, we hope in the resurrection. So Lord, we pray as the, the services this week that you would give his family peace. Lord, would you encourage them? And Lord, for those who don't know the hope of the resurrection, for those who don't know the peace of Christ, for those who don't know that death doesn't end all, Lord, would you open their eyes, open their ears, soften their hearts towards what they might receive at that service. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, I pray for our cultural conversation on Thursday. Lord, we admit that uh, following you in, in any culture, in any place, has challenges and, and difficulties because this world isn't the way it's supposed to be, and we know we aren't the way we're supposed to be. And yet, Lord, you call us to follow after you, to pick up your yoke and follow your way. And so, Father, we want to do that in, in every aspect of our life, Lord, and we pray in particular that we would do it with our politics. So I pray that this Thursday night would be a time of mutual encouragement. It would be a time of learning. It would be a time of relationship building. And Lord, I, I pray that, that walking away from it, all who gather would be encouraged and empowered through the power of the Holy Spirit to love you, God, better and to love their neighbor better. So Lord, in your mercy, here. And Father, I pray now in... Uh, as we are prepared to hear your word read and preach, Lord, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, Lord, soften our hearts to receive what you have for us and what you feed us today, Lord, would you help it to be the fuel in which we live our lives for you. So, Lord, in your mercy, and we pray all this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I invite Wanda up now to uh, read our scripture for us. Good morning, church. Today, our scripture is from Luke 4, 42 through 5, 11. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogue of Judea. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genereset, the people were crowding around him and listened to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to pull out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. <clears throat> when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
Thanks, Wanda. Good morning, church. Good to be with you. My name is Guy, if I haven't met you. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to bring a message from God's Word this morning. So it was way back in 1999, some 25 years ago, I took my wife Maureen to a concert at the Crystal Ballroom in Portland, Oregon. It was Bella Fleck and the Flecktones. This will probably mean nothing to most of you. Bella Fleck and the Flecktones, Victor Wooten on bass. Uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> and we're really not concert people, but I saw this and I'm like, Marine, we're going. Like, we have to go. It's sort of like jazz, rock kind of a concert. That is not Bella Fleck and the Flecktones. Victor Wooten is not on that stage. But that is the Crystal Ballroom. It is one of the premier concert venues anywhere. It's a big open floor, but not too big. It's an old building. It's on the second floor. And when the music gets going and the people start moving with the music, the whole floor bounces because it's on the second floor. And then you think, is, is this building going to collapse? And the whole thing is, so we're kind of shy, so we were off to the side. Actually, I think we were, there's a few seats at the balcony. And Maureen wasn't as excited as I was, so I said, well, we'll go up in the balcony, and there's a few seats. But when we got there, I'm looking at this whole thing, and I'm like, I have to go down on that floor. Like, I have to. I have to get up to that stage. I have to see Victor Wooten playing his bass. So I went down, and I started to push my way through the crowd. It's shoulder to shoulder, body to body, and the music is going, and the floor is bouncing, and I'm pushing my way, and I shoved my way all the way to the front of the stage, and I got directly in front of Victor, and I just looked up at him and went, go. You're so awesome. You're so great. <laughs> All right, so you can take that down. That happened. <laughs> and what's weird is that this week, all week long, this has been the picture in my mind as I've been reflecting on our passage in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. And the reason, you, you could take, take that away. Thanks, uh, slide. <laughs> thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> is it going? No, oh, thanks. Okay. The reason that picture has been in my mind is because it's the crowd in Luke chapter 5 that especially caught my eye, caught my attention. Let me just review for you what it says in Luke 5, 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, another name of an area of the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. The people are crowding, and, and literally in the Greek, it's more graphic, and it says they were pressing in to hear the Word of God. They're pressing in in this crowd to hear the words of Jesus. In fact, so much so that Jesus has to requisition a fishing boat, get in the boat. He says, shove off a little bit, and so he had like a uh, a, a boat stage, and there he is, and the people are on the shore, and they're pressing in to hear the word of Christ. It strikes me that there is something intensely attractional about the life and the words of Jesus Christ. It was Augustine who said it like this. He said, his life was lightning, and his words were thunder. And I think that he got it exactly right. Now, I realize that many people had come to see Jesus because of the miracles. And so they had heard, there's a miracle worker, and people are getting healed. So many people came for the miracles. Maybe some people came because they thought they could get a free lunch, <laughs> When Jesus multiplied loaves and fish and people are going, this is awesome. I'm like, it's going to hang out here like this. But that's not the case in Luke chapter 5. These people have come and they're pressing in to hear his words. They want to hear what he has to say. There's something beautiful. There's something profound. There's something different about the words 
of Jesus and they're being drawn to Jesus and his words. And this has been building for quite some time. And that's why I wanted to read at the end of chapter 4 those verses that kind of lead into our main story. In 442, it says, At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, but the people are looking for him. I mean, Jesus is so attractional that people are saying, no, we have to go find him. I mean, he's out in the wilderness. And people are trekking to find him, and they're begging him, please don't leave. But listen to what he said. He said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in the other towns also. That's, that's why I was sent. So I have to go. I have more to share. I have more people to speak to. And it says, he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He went from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, and he proclaimed good news. He didn't just heal people. He didn't just meet their physical needs. He's there to actually proclaim a message unlike anything that they've ever heard in their life before. It's amazing. And so the enthusiasm grows. The crowds grow. They're following him. They follow him to the lake. He has to now, he can't just be in a synagogue anymore. There's too big of a crowd. He has to go outside. He goes by the lake. People are pressing in to hear his words. And so it seems to me that long before the call of Peter to be a fisher of men, we find out the greater truth, and that is that it is Jesus who is actually the great fisher of men and women. It's Jesus who has drawn this great crowd. It's Jesus who has attracted people with his words. I like to say that people have been taken captive by the words of Christ. It reminds me of a story in the Gospel of John in which the religious leaders sent out guards to arrest Jesus. And they went out all decked out. They had their weapons. The adrenaline was up. They're going out. They're going to bring Jesus in to the religious leaders. And they came back empty-handed. And it says in John 7, 45 and 46, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? Where is Jesus? What are you doing? Do your job. And the guards responded, No one ever spoke the way this man does. His life is lightning. His words are thunder. They went out to arrest Jesus, and they became captives to his words. Don't you love that? I just love that. I love it. No one ever spoke like this man. That's a consistent theme in the Gospels. Jesus proclaimed the Sermon on the Mount. They got to the end. It says the people were astonished because he spoke in such a way, with such authority, in such beauty. It was unlike any of their religious leaders. It said no one ever spoke like this man. It's amazing. The attractional words of Jesus. So I have a word of encouragement for us this morning. As we think about Sharing our faith with others. In fact, you can think of this whole sermon as a word of encouragement for us about sharing our faith with others. And of course, it will take the form of three points. And so, um, if you want to record points, here's encouraging word, or should I say point number one. Lots more people are interested in Jesus than we might think. There's a lot more people interested in Jesus than, than we imagine. You remember that crowd on the beach pressing in to hear the words of Jesus? Well, I believe that crowd is still out there. They're still out there. There's a multitude of people who are actually interested in Jesus. It was March 1966, when John Lennon was being interviewed by the British press as the Beatles were rising to the top of their popularity, and he said famously, or maybe infamously, <laughs> that the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. 
I don't know, maybe so many people were rushing the stage at Beatles concerts that it just went to his head. Here's the full quote. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. <laughs> well, there you go. Meanwhile, more people are coming to faith in Christ around the world than ever. A mind-boggling statistic, maybe you've heard it, about the growth of Christian faith in China, which many people estimate has grown in 40 years, in the last 40 years, from 1 million believers to 100 million believers. I think I've got a quote on this. Do I have a quote? Maybe. Maybe not. If not, I'll tell it to you. Daryl Ireland from Boston University School of Theology, research assistant professor of mission. That's a long title. I'm fascinated that over the last 40 years, Christianity has grown faster in China than any other place in the world. It's gone from approximately 1 million Christians to around 100 million. That's an incredible explosion. It is, isn't it? <laughs> sorry, John. I'm sorry, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. We have, we had, I should say, when I was pastoring up in Portland, a, a wonderful couple. They're still at the church, Ryan and Noelani Lee. And um, they had their girls in a Chinese immersion school. And there is a cultural exchange teacher coming from China. This young lady came to teach in this cultural or in this language immersion school, Chinese immersion school, for one year. And so Ryan and Noelani said, we'll host. We'll host this young lady. So she lived with them for almost a year. And so she came as an atheist, and she, they would bring her every week to church. She'd come to church and listen, kind of bewildered at first by this. But she kept listening and listening. And, you know, the life of Jesus is lightning and his words are thunder. And there's something attractional and beautiful about the life and words of Jesus. And so she started to tune in. And not just that, but the witness of this family, the love and grace of this Christian family and the words of Christ that she was hearing over and over again began to work in her and work in her. She got on a plane finally to go back to China. And she was kind of at her wit's end. She's like, what should I do? Should I become a Christian? I don't know what to do. And she prayed and she said, God, you have to give me a sign. Because it's a big deal, you know, for her. You have to give me a sign, Lord, to know whether Christianity is true, whether I should become a Christian. She boarded the plane and she sat down and a man came and sat next to her. And that man was a Christian who shared his faith in Christ with her on that whole flight back to China. He just spoke the words of Christ. He told his own story of faith in Christ. And by the time she got off that plane, she had decided, this is a sign from God. And she became a Christian. She got back to China. She contacted my friends. She said, I'm a Christian now. She found a church. She was baptized. Isn't that a great story? I love that. What about right here in our own country? A recent survey tells us that amongst Gen Z generation, whatever that is, I think it's 20 to 35, something like that, nearly half report that they are extremely curious about Jesus Christ. But if you go in the lower age bracket, and that is 18 to 21, more like 56% report that they are extremely curious about Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that that crowd on the beach pressing in to hear the words of Jesus, I think that crowd is still out there. Now, I know that there will always be those who take their stand against the Christian faith. But sometimes, just like those guards in John 7, they will also become captive to the words of Christ. 
There was a young man who came to our church in Portland. His name is Patrick Williams. And he was an enthusiastic Christian. I said, Patrick, tell, what's your story? He said, well, I served in the Marine Corps. And I went and I fought in Desert Storm. And I saw a lot of things over there. And it, it, was, it was just hurtful to my mind. And he said, I really became negative on the Christian faith. He was very negative on Christianity. He went to Oregon State University, and he got a master's degree in interdisciplinary studies, and he had to do a master's dissertation, a master's thesis, and his advisor for his thesis was a man named Marcus Borg. Now, Marcus Borg is a great deconstructor of the Christian faith, and Marcus Borg actually said to him, this is a true story, he said, Patrick, for your dissertation, what you should do is you should go around and interview Christian pastors and write a dissertation exposing the foolishness of those who hold an orthodox view of Christian faith. And Patrick said, that sounds like a good idea. So Patrick went out and started interviewing pastors. And he's going to churches, he's interviewing pastors, and he told me, you know, the weird thing is, the more I interviewed pastors, the more I got interested in Jesus. They just were telling me about Jesus. And I became intrigued with Jesus. He said, they didn't seem like they were crazy to me or loonies or anything, because I didn't expect this. But I found myself being drawn to Jesus. And at the end of all of his interviews, he became a Christian. He got baptized. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. He went back. To, he wrote his dissertation. He went back to Marcus Borg. Marcus Borg said, why didn't you arrest him? <laughs> why didn't you bring him in? What are you doing? And I guess Patrick Williams said, no, no man ever spoke like this man. My heart was captivated by the truth of Jesus Christ and the beauty of his words, and the glory of the gospel. And he became a Christian. He became a philosophy professor at a local college where he's there as a witness for Christ. Isn't that a great story? I love that. Encouraging word point number one, there are far more people interested in Jesus than you might think. But here's point number two of encouragement. God uses imperfect people as messengers of the gospel. And this is where we come to the part about Peter. This is the story of Peter. And you remember what happened, right? So Jesus is teaching, and then he says to Peter, he says, well, push off a little ways here, and you let down your nets for a catch. And then Peter's like, well, pff, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything, right? And actually, this isn't the right time to fish. You fish at night, you don't fish now. We're not going to catch anything. I'm paraphrasing. I'm adding. I'm in the thought stream of Peter. And he's like, you don't know what you're doing. I know fishing. You know preaching. Let's stick to our areas here. Maybe that's what's going on in his mind. I love this. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the nets. <laughs> love that. You see, Peter is also captured by the words of Christ. <laughs> He has all of his own, you know, things like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. But he's like, yeah, but phew, my heart is captive to the words of Christ. So he says, okay, let's do it. They catch so many fish that they're bringing them in and the boats are sinking. And here's this moment where Peter, he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Maybe it was just that he had had all those negative thoughts and he realized Man, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy to serve Jesus. Or maybe, I, I have my own angle on this, maybe he said, you know, if Jesus can see all the fish down there, maybe he can see what's in here. But either way, he, he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Now, it's pretty obvious in this story that Jesus is recruiting Peter to become a fisher of men and women just like Jesus is. 
Peter is being called to join Jesus in what Jesus is already doing in being a fisher of men and women. Jesus is the great fisher. Now he's recruiting Peter and saying, come on, I, I want you to do this too. I want you to help me with this great gospel mission of fishing for men and women in the gospel. And Peter just, in that moment, he feels completely unworthy. You know, when I read the story of the calling of Peter to become a fisher of men and women, I start to tense up. I don't know about you, but I read this story and I kind of, my shoulders start to get tense. I'm like, start to grip the table. <laughs> and it's because I sense, you probably sense it too, that this isn't just about Peter. It's actually about all the disciples. In fact, later it says they all went and became fishers of men. It's about all. And then we realize, you know, we're, we're doing the math and we're going, well, wait a minute. It's not just about them. This is about us. This, this is about us. And we start to lock up because we learned two weeks ago, great message from Patrick, that it's hard. Evangelism is hard. Reaching out to our neighbors for Christ is difficult. We start to lock up. We go, I can't do that. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I'm not worthy. Who am I to really do that? Here's good news for us. Here's an encouraging word for us. Peter is learning that God uses imperfect people as messengers of the gospel. Peter is learning that God uses sinners saved by grace to reach out to sinners with the gospel of grace. You know, later in the chapter, you can later go home, it's Sunday, you need to read the Bible. Read chapter 5. Read chapter 5. He goes and he meets a string of people. And at the end of the chapter, he says, I've come to save sinners. They're all sinners. But you know what? Peter can't be used of Christ to go reach sinners if he thinks he's above them. If we think we're above people, we can't come to them with Jesus. What's required to be a fisher of men and women? Well, it's, I guess it starts with a humble heart. It, heart, it starts with a heart that's already been touched by the grace of God. I'm a sinner, and yet I'm received by Christ. And Jesus says, now you're ready. Now you're ready. The outcome of the fishing expedition did not depend on Peter's wisdom, skill, or power. Jesus says, go out here and let's do some fishing. And he goes, well, you know, I know it's not going to work. I have this experience, blah, blah, blah. And yet, and yet, this dynamic miracle, the catch of fish, all of which is just kind of a miraculous parable, the outcome wasn't dependent on Peter's wisdom, skill, or power. And you know what? Here's good news. Here's an encouraging word for you. The outcome of your Sharing your faith with Christ to other people is not dependent on your wisdom, skill, or power, but on the miraculous work of Jesus Christ. And he does that miraculous work. He's alive. And he still does that work. I think Peter learned the lesson. You know, on the day of Pentecost, he stood up. Peter stands up. And there's a great crowd. And it's insanity. And he just stands up and he starts preaching. And you know, he's, now he's joining Jesus. He's becoming a fisher of men and women. <laughs> and he preaches a sermon. You know what happened? 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. 3,000. What a great catch. <laughs> 3,000 people. It wasn't dependent on Peter's wisdom, skill, power. Just his humble obedience. And boom, all of a sudden. So that's an encouraging word to me. And I have one final, because I have to have the third point. And the third point is simply this. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is multidimensional. Now that might not excite you, that title, as much as it does me. But I want you to think with me for a minute. The gospel of Jesus Christ is multidimensional. And what that means is when we share our faith with others, we have different options for where to begin. 
different options of what to focus on. And so I think we've got some categories here. And the categories are, do we have them on a slide? There they are. Forgiveness, healing, and hope. All right? These are dimensions of the gospel. Now, assignment, it's Sunday, go read the Bible, read chapter 4 and 5, and list all the dimensions of the gospel that you can find in chapters 4 and 5. I'm just listing three of them here. Many dimensions of the gospel. Now, let's talk about forgiveness first, because this is where we usually begin. This is what we think of first. When we think of sharing the gospel, we think, well, people are guilty in sin, and they need to be forgiven, right? And rightfully, that is a great starting point, because guilt and forgiveness is actually at the very center of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And this was something we focused on two weeks ago. You remember the story of the paralytic? It also shows up in Luke 5 today. You'll read it later today. The paralytic. And he gets carried in, and they're looking for a healing, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. It's a key dimension of the gospel. But it's helpful to remember that this is not the only dimension of the gospel. It's not the only dimension. Super important and actually helpful to remember this. I remember talking to a frustrated seminary student. And the seminary student said, you know, I'm kind of frustrated because I keep hearing, I keep learning that the gospel is all about guilt and forgiveness, guilt and forgiveness. And yet the people that I talk to every day out on the street and in the community, they don't have a sense of guilt. <laughs> and so I feel like it's my job, job number one is to convince them that they're guilty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're guilty. No, I'm not. <laughs> like, I don't feel that way, right? Well, they are guilty. They just don't feel it, right? So is that job number one? I have to convince everyone that they're guilty? I don't believe that's job number one. It could be in certain cases, but there are many dimensions to the gospel. And so I was thinking with this seminary student and saying, well, you know, there's other dimensions. Let's think about two. Let's think about healing and hope. Now, when I talk about healing, I don't mean just physical healing, but I mean healing for people with broken hearts and broken lives. So let me share a passage with you. It's Luke 4, 18 through 21. And this is called, we call this the synagogue sermon that Jesus gave. It's, it's his first sermon in a synagogue. It's in Luke chapter 4. It's considered to be the heart and soul of the whole book of Luke. Very important. And so, these are important words. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, listen carefully, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he paused for effect, and he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, when you read these words of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. Do you get a sense that there's, there's an aspect of this that it's like the healing of the broken, broken lives, lives broken by sin, not just guilty in sin, but broken by sin. People who are in despair. People who are captive to all kinds of things. And there's a dimension of the gospel here that's so important. Now, this is what fascinates me. I've often asked myself this question. It said in Luke, it said Jesus went around from synagogue to synagogue and he preached. Synagogue to synagogue to synagogue and he preached the message. And I'm always thinking, well, what, what did he say? 
What did he say? From synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. And the biggest clue that we have is this passage in Luke 4. What if Jesus, from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, is saying exactly the same thing? No wonder people are flooding out of their homes and coming to Jesus and saying, that's beautiful. I need that. I need that in my life. The attractional words of Jesus, sometimes we can begin from the place of people's hurt or their brokenness, trying to hear it and listen to it and tell them, you know, Jesus heals broken lives. Or maybe it's hope. It was hope for me. I was like Patrick Williams. I, I was an unbeliever and I was against Christian faith. I had no sense of guilt whatsoever, like zero. But I was guilty. I didn't even have any sense of brokenness, but I was completely broken. But the one thing in my life that I knew is that I had no hope. Absolutely hopeless. No hope. For the present, no hope for eternity. And someone challenged me to read the words of the gospel. I began to read the gospel of John and somehow hope was sparked through the words of Christ. His words were like thunder. The hope was, was just sparked in me. And I became a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I was both guilty and broken, but I didn't even know it. And then I became a follower of Christ, and I went to church, and I listened, and I found out, oh, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. But Jesus forgives sins. Oh, I'm broken. But Jesus heals the brokenhearted and gives us a new life in Christ. And now all the dimensions of the gospel start to work together in the most beautiful way. So be encouraged, my friends, because the gospel has many dimensions and every one of them can become the perfect starting point or place as we share our faith with those around us. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful to have the privilege of gazing at Christ, of seeing your beauty, hearing your words, words unlike any other, being in awe of your message, which is more beautiful than, than any message that we could hear. Lord, truly, you, you have taken our hearts captive, Lord, by these things. And in that captivity, we're actually just set free. Thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we think of this call to, to share the work of, of gospel fishing, so to speak, and it intimidates us, Lord. We feel unworthy and unable. How comforting, Lord, to see that you take sinners and, and people who don't have all the skill to do amazing things, and you do amazing things through them, Lord. Thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to grow in our faith and to grow in our ability to reach out to those around us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, guy. Thank you for that. That was an encouragement. Yeah. <laughs> You know, as Guy has, has reminded us, Jesus is the great fisherman, and he has caught us, and he says, come to this table and, and eat and be empowered, and then go fish for others. And so on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup. The cup of the new covenant in his blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat from the bread and we drink from the cup, we proclaim Jesus as the great fisherman. The one who has caught us and has given us forgiveness and healing and hope. 
and then sends us out with that sense of forgiveness, healing, and hope to proclaim that to others. It's a table that reminds us that we are empowered in Christ. So, Father, thank you for the bread. Thank you for the cup. Thank you for this, this good reminder, Lord, that, that we have been caught by you. Lord, thank you for this mission that you have given us, Lord, that it isn't, it isn't based on our, our ability or skill. Lord, it is, it is based on your call to us and your empowering of us. So we thank you for that. And we pray in a moment as we rise and we eat and drink and take and hold that we would, we would sense that, Christ, you are, are feeding us, empowering us for the work ahead for us. And now together in one voice, we pray the prayer aloud. You taught your disciples to pray. Praying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll invite you to rise from your seats and by grace through faith, come to the table now and eat and drink. Let's stand together as we finish our service today, singing of the words that Jesus taught, the words that we get from God, that everything that he promises is yes and amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. Brought me out of darkness, you have filled me.
We'll go uh, today in the benediction with that third dimension of the gospel, hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.